Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and this, I think, is the biggest volcanic eruption I've ever seen viewed by a satellite. So, these are two images from geostationary satellites. On the left, we have Himawari 8. On the right, we have Goes West. And you don't need to look that hard to see this giant plume forming just as the sun sets over the eastern Pacific. It's actually from Tonga. It's, the place is called Hunga Tonga Hunga Haapai. Uh, it's actually two separate islands which became one and then exploded in spectacular style, creating a dust cloud which is hundreds of kilometers across. I mean, this is like going from nothing to the size of a country in about, you know, an hour. And let's be clear, while this island is uninhabited, there are lots of people living on islands nearby. If you look close to the center there, that is the main island of Tonga with the capital there. And we got a lot of images from the islands as the eruption started, the skies got dark and eventually went black, and then the internet's gone out. So we're not really getting great communication from there. But so far I hear that there have been no fatalities, which is a good thing. The main effect on the rest of the world so far, however, has been a tsunami which spread around the Pacific. It uh, was much larger, obviously, to places nearby, but it came up to the US West Coast and it just happened to hit close to high tide. So places near me like Santa Cruz had serious water inundation. But obviously the most striking thing that we see from the satellite imagery is this massive plume of ash, which is hundreds of kilometers across. And it's, you know, the, the fact that it happened just around sunset meant that we, you, know, you could really see the detail on those clouds. Uh, these were rising up to about 17 kilometers, 55,000 feet. This is the view from the US satellite. But if we switch over to the Japanese satellite Himawari 8, you can see it from the other side. You can see it casting a shadow down, you know, towards away from the camera, so to speak. Again, these satellites, these are 36,000 kilometers away. They're designed for weather prediction. They can observe in 16 different frequency bands. And yeah, there's a lot of information that's no doubt coming out of these. But from what I can see, it's just a massively uh, impactful event for anybody that is living in that area. The worldwide effects aren't just the tsunami as well. If you look in this sequence, you can just about make out uh, like a sound wave, a pressure wave moving outward. I think that's a pressure wave. It's moving at roughly the right speed. So this I specifically looked in the near infrared because that seemed to bring out the effects of the pressure. And that pressure wave has been tracked all the way around the world. Obviously, like nearby, people could hear it. Like in Fiji, 1,000 kilometers away, people could hear it. In New Zealand, 3,000 kilometers away, people could hear it. There are reports of people hearing it in Alaska. And of course, the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organization, they have a network of microphones designed to detect nuclear tests, and they found it. I'm sure they will give, tell us just exactly how powerful this event was. But the pressure wave is sufficiently low frequency and deep enough to show up on just regular weather stations. This is the weather at uh, Half Moon Bay Airport showing it. And this is all the weather stations in Japan. And if you play the readings over time, you can see a pressure wave crossing the country. That scale, by the way, is hectopascals. One hectopascal is about one thousandth of the pressure uh, of sea at sea level. Similarly, in the US, you can see a pressure wave crossing towards the northeast, just taking pressure data at 15 minute intervals. In the immediate vicinity of the eruption, there's been something like 100,000 lightning strikes that have been logged by you know, lightning tracker networks. All that heat, turbulence, dust and water is a great way to generate those charge differences that let lightning happen. So this is obviously a very, very powerful event. It's very likely the energy released here is many times that of the largest nuclear weapon ever tested. And I'm not sure what the island will look like after this, but I know that if you go back 10 years or so, you actually have two separate islands, or basically islands on the rim of a caldera, which is sort of in the middle here. And yeah, about you know five, 10 years ago, we started to have eruptions that built up this island. And scientists from NASA actually spent a lot of time uh, studying this because from a geological standpoint, it was probably the best example of island building in recent times. So it was well documented and well covered by satellites. 
So the initial eruptions were between these two islands and they built up a spit of land between them. And normally they would have expected that to get slowly washed away by weathering and removed. But you know, the action of the sea and the actions of the, the chemistry meant that it actually formed into like harder rock and it became a more permanent feature. This is what the islands looked like until recently. This is actually what Google Maps shows you if you browse there. Obviously, this is now out of date. It's worth noting that these islands are actually just on the top side of a much larger submerged caldera. So the actual volcano is much larger, most of it is just submerged. And of course all of this is fed by the melting of the Pacific Plate as it subducts underneath the Australian Plate. Anyway, over the last few weeks there have been a series of eruptions and we can follow the changes in detail thanks to Planet Labs who have of course a fleet of satellites that are able to observe the, uh, you know, the Earth pretty much like Google Maps but every 24 hours. So you can see the eruptions built up this area in between a whole lot more. And then on Friday afternoon there was a pretty serious eruption. In fact that eruption was itself visible from space. These are images by the Tonga Geological Service. They went out on a boat and they saw like the, the ash rising to tens of thousands of feet. And after that settled down, Planet Labs got another image showing basically the middle of the island having largely been demolished. And this is just a couple of hours before the really big eruption. So we don't know what's happened after this. But from geostationary orbit, we can see that uh, there's still a lot of clouds and you know dust and ash in the air. We also catch another eruption happening this morning showing that the volcano is still very much active at this point. Uh, it's certainly not as big as the eruption on Friday or Saturday, and hopefully that means that things are subsiding and we're not going to expect another big blast like that. Like Long term, we are going to have to be concerned about the amount of debris and ash and everything that this is throwing into the atmosphere. This, you know, There have certainly been cases in the past where uh, large volcanic eruptions have affected the climate for a few years. The most recent and therefore most famous and well documented would be Mount Tambora which erupted in 1815 and triggered the year without summer. Uh, you know, essentially the amount of dust it threw into the atmosphere um, combined with you know, cold temperatures and nucleation meant that you just had persistent low temperatures for a year. It caused uh, really low crop yields which of course in turn led to famine and all sorts of other problems. I'm certainly not saying that this is anywhere close to this that scale of event. I don't actually know right now. All I know is that we saw it from space without even looking too hard and that makes it an incredibly impressive event. And I'm hoping that people in immediate proximity are safe and sound. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe. Fly safe.